War of the Worlds: The Resurrection A Novel by J. M. Dillard Chapter IV "I know I chose your resume over the others," Harrison said. They had left the older one story brick building and were walking in the brilliant sunshine again, cutting across the thick grass instead of taking the sidewalks that connected the buildings. The older brick structures gave way to newer, sleeker edifices. The Institute had the sprawled out feel of a college campus, and the atmosphere was certainly relaxed. Other than Dr. Jacobi, Suzanne hadn't spotted another researcher wearing a tie. The conservative gray gabardine suit she wore no doubt marked her as an outsider. Maybe Deb wasn't the only one who needed new clothes. Blackwood turned to regard Suzanne with those disarming pale blue eyes. But I looked over so many. Could you remind me a little about your background? As the sun warmed her face, she began to understand how he had acquired his tan. I'm flattered you chose me, but my background is pretty unsensational. He seemed amused by that. That's your opinion. Yes, well, I did my postgrad at NYU and MIT, then worked for the Smithsonian, then ran for a few years, then a research facility in Ohio. I thought you worked with NASA. Blackwood watched her reaction. Yes, it was a joint project with Zubrowski Labs. I explained it all to Dr. Jacobi. Her tone was slightly reproachful. So why didn't you bother to get the details from him sooner? Ah, Blackwood nodded. Of course, I remember now. And your background? Suzanne asked, so I can try to figure out why you've hired me. He shrugged cavalierly. Oh, astrophysics, UCLA. He gazed at the grounds with tangible fondness and gestured sweepingly. I've spent my whole career at this place, even grew up here. It's almost like home. No wonder he acted as if he owned the place and had such a casual, easy attitude toward Jacobi. I wouldn't mind finding a home, she said, feeling wistful, then realized she had revealed too much and covered with a question. What about your family? Your parents? They both worked here, too. His expression didn't change, but it seemed a shadow passed over his features. She was silent for a moment unwilling to ask the obvious. They took several steps without speaking. Then Suzanne asked, Tell me, Dr. Blackwood, about your projects that need someone in my field? He smiled. The darkness dispelled as quickly as it had come. Not Dr. Harrison. I dislike formality and I hate titles. She refused to be distracted so easily. Look, Harrison, I've come all the way from Ohio, and no one has told me anything about the projects we're supposed to be working on. It can't be that secret. Close to it, he said cheerfully, and turned his head sharply to look at her. Will there be any problem with your putting in a little overtime? She tensed. Damn it, she knew the job offer was too good to be true. Yes, as a matter of fact... I explained to Dr. Jacobi I have a young daughter. I avoid working nights and weekends, but Monday through Friday I give 150%. That's a mathematical impossibility, he replied and smiled. A daughter. That's nice. How old is she? His interest seemed so genuine that she relaxed a little. Debbie's eleven, a sixth grader. Eleven, huh? Pretty difficult age, if I remember correctly. Not quite a baby, but not really a teenager, either. She shook her head and smiled a little ruefully. Difficult is an understatement, but then I don't remember any age as being particularly easy. I suppose not. He paused. Look, maybe we can work something out, but I'm not going to lie to you. There could be times when we'll need you to work late. Maybe if your husband's willing to help out. He's not she snapped, and then in a calmer, lower voice, We're divorced. Oh, sorry. He looked sheepish. I'm not, 
Suzanne replied, trying hard to sound as if she meant it. They had arrived at the entrance to another building. She stopped in her tracks as he held open the glass door. But you still haven't told me what this project is about. He smiled and gestured her through. There's someone I'd like you to meet first. He led her down a corridor to a door marked Communications Center. The instant he opened it, she was greeted by the overwhelmingly seductive fragrance of coffee. Inside, the room was filled with enough sophisticated equipment to make NASA and SAC jealous. Consoles, computers, transmitters, and receivers lined the walls and counters. A series of photographs on the wall showed a muscular black man in a wheelchair with a racing number pinned to his jersey, and beneath, in careful hand lettering, the legends. Marine Corps Marathon 1984, Boston Marathon 1986, L.A. Marathon 1987. In the far corner of the room, a man sat peering intently at a computer monitor. Norton, Harrison began, I want you to... His focus still on the monitor. Norton raised a coffee-colored hand in a plea for silence, but it was too late. He groaned, his concentration broken. Maybe we should come back another time, Suzanne whispered in Blackwood's ear, but he propelled her over to where Norton sat. Six under, one to go, Norton complained bitterly, staring into the flashing screen. Harrison, didn't anyone ever teach you any manners? You're not supposed to interrupt a man when he's standing at the tee. Suzanne was close enough now to see the graphics on the screen. A little golfer wearing a funny hat and checked knickers stood, his club resting on his shoulder, while Norton's score flashed in the upper right-hand corner. She shot Harrison a narrow look. Important secret projects, lots of overtime, huh? Harrison shrugged, his expression innocent. Norton swiveled slowly to face them. For the first time, Suzanne noticed the automated wheelchair. Norton's long-sleeved shirt hid most of the muscles that showed in the photograph, but he still looked square-shouldered and strong in his late thirties. He peered up at Suzanne with large brown eyes set in a broad, friendly face. "'Who are you?' he asked point-blank, yet another one who had no use for formalities. She was slightly taken aback. "'Suzanne. Suzanne McCullough.' Norton Drake, he grinned with a sudden disconcerting warmth, and extended his hand. She gave it a firm shake. Welcome to the pit, Suzanne. I've already been given the standard welcome, she answered dryly. Suzanne is the new microbiologist Ephraim's been promising us, Harrison explained. Norton cocked his head and scrutinized her clinically. Doesn't look like a microbiologist. Everyone in our micro-department is nearsighted and losing his hair. He shook his head. No, she looks more like a biochemist. He winked at Harrison. Which reminds me, you have caught sight of the new addition to biochem, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Mona LaRue, haven't you, Harrison? Harrison grinned. Later, Norton. Forgive me, I'm being a poor host. Coffee, Suzanne? God, I'd love some. It smells wonderful. Please, Norton raised a brow. I believe I can work with this woman, Harrison. Then, in a different tone, Gertrude, back three, right forty-five, forward ten. The wheelchair whined mechanically and started backing away from the monitor. Please don't bother, she began. I can get at my... Norton shot her such a threatening glance that she broke off, ashamed of her patronizing attitude. And miss the chance to show off? he asked lightly. Harrison was smiling, relaxed. Apparently, he knew Norton well enough to be completely unaffected by Suzanne's discomfort over his handicap. Don't worry. Norton lives to show off his voice-activated dragster. Old news, Harrison, Norton said on his way to the drip coffee maker on the low counter. Got something better. Been working on the blend for months. The wheelchair rolled to a stop at the counter. Norton picked up a cup and poured steaming coffee into it. He glanced over at Suzanne. You'd like it black, I hope. I like it black, she answered quickly. At this point, she was willing to drink it cold through a straw, 
and it did smell heavenly. Good. I'm afraid I don't stock the accoutrements. Gertrude, back three, forward ten. The chair began moving again. None of these healthy California Lala types here touch the demon caffeine. They'd rather drink herbal teas with cutesy little names like Granny's Tummy Comfort or Sassafras Sunset, and this is a scientific institute. Shocking, isn't it? And here it is a well-known fact that caffeine improves brain function. Harrison snickered. Only up to a certain point, which you've definitely gone past. After that, it's all downhill. Norton sniffed at that. Suzanne forced herself to stand still and wait for him to return and hand her the cup. What exactly do you do here, Norton? You mean besides play computer golf? Harrison quipped. Shut up, Blackwood. Dr. McCullough is asking a question. Norton cleared his throat and said with practiced glibness, I collect and analyze radio transmissions from deep space, trying to separate natural phenomena from that which could be made by intelligent life. She sipped the coffee, which tasted every bit as good as it smelled, as she listened. So, an extraterrestrial project. She'd been right to assume she'd been hired on the basis of her NASA project experience. Sounds like interesting work, and this coffee is heaven. Thank you. She turned to Harrison. Now how do I fit in? But he was looking down at his watch. Gee, where's the time gone? I'm sorry, but I have a meeting with Shulman in five minutes. Should last till lunch. He glanced apologetically at Norton. Norton, old buddy, could you help me out and show Suzanne to her new office? Sure, except I don't know where it is. But you know the one. Clayton's old office? Harrison gave Norton a brisk pat on the shoulder, then turned to Suzanne. I really wanted to take you to lunch today to discuss the project, but I'm afraid my fiancé has other plans for me today. Maybe we can get together for a talk after lunch? If it's not too much trouble, she said in very clipped tones. She was furious at him for ignoring her questions as if she didn't matter, and furious at herself for actually feeling a twinge when he mentioned his fiancé. As usual, he ignored her frosty glare on the way out. No trouble, he said pleasantly. No trouble at all. He left, closing the door behind him. Norton was shaking his head and grinning. He's not singling you out, Suzanne. He drives us all crazy. She gave Harrison until two o'clock, before she wandered down the hallway and knocked on the closed door. She doubted he'd be the type to arrive back from lunch any earlier. No answer. How on earth did the man manage to procure such a prestigious job taking two-hour lunches and playing practical jokes on his colleagues? Working with him was not going to be pleasant. Suzanne was turning to go when she saw the light under the door, and raised her clenched fist to knock again then decided she might as well start practicing the local customs. She turned the doorknob and pushed. He was there all right, with his feet propped up on the desk, crunching on a granola bar. A small pony of light beer sat on top of a stack of dusty, stained manila folders. One of the files lay open, its aging contents scattered randomly atop the desk. But Harrison was not studying the files. He was staring intently at a yellowed black-and-white photograph with curled-up ends. Suzanne got only a fleeting glimpse of his melancholic expression before it changed back to the good-humored mask. She glanced disapprovingly at the granola bar and the beer. I thought you said that you had lunch with your fiancé? He scrambled to sit up, nearly overturning the beer onto the files, and shoved the old photo into the top drawer, then closed the folder. Well, he gave her another one of those boyish grins. She passed over the remark, refusing to be embarrassed by him any more. I'm sorry, she said without making any effort to sound as if she meant it. I didn't mean to disturb you. You didn't. Uh, what do you need? She emitted a short, frustrated sigh. Either he was so absent-minded he'd forgotten, or he was having fun at her expense by pretending to forget. 
It was beginning to look like she would not be able to work with this man. Direction. You never told me what I was supposed to be doing. Ah, right. Come in and sit down. She sat in the uncomfortable wooden chair next to his desk and fixed her gaze on him. He fidgeted a little nervously. I suppose Ephraim told you this project was pretty hush-hush. Not in so many words, but from the way everyone was acting, I assumed it was a classified government project. Not the government. He shook his head, ruefully amused. I don't think the government would appreciate what we're doing. Her mouth fell open at that. He rushed to reassure her. Sorry, bad joke. We sometimes work with the government. Now isn't one of those times. I just meant we weren't getting a lot of cooperation from them. I'm sure you know how that can be. She didn't. I've worked on classified projects before. It's considered normal to brief the people involved. I can't help if I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. He paused awkwardly, as if searching for the right words. Well, today I thought you could just get settled in and then we'd talk about the project. I'm already settled in, she replied quickly. Let's talk about the project. He gazed out the window for an instant and cleaned his throat. Okay, <clears throat> um, you already know Norton's role in all this. To analyze radio transmissions from deep space, Suzanne answered a bit impatiently, searching for intelligent life. He looked at her with those penetrating blue eyes of his and nodded. Problem is, there's a whole lot of space to cover. A bunch of wasted space, practically speaking, since the universe is maybe ten million billion trillion times as much empty space as it is stellar material. I need you to narrow our focus. She frowned, unable to understand what he was driving at. Albite, how am I supposed to do that? Simple. His eyes widened innocently. A little too innocently, Suzanne decided. By daydreaming. Confused, she blinked at him. By daydreaming? You want to run that by me again? Daydream about other worlds. He meshed his fingers, put his hands behind his neck, and leaned back comfortably in his chair. About the life forms they might support. Give me probables, possibles, give me what ifs. She stared disbelievingly at him for a full half minute before she found her voice. Excuse me, Dr. Blackwood, but I know when my leg is being pulled, you can't be serious. What's so unbelievable about it? You give me a what-if life form, and I can design a model atmosphere that can support it. Then Norton can limit his intercepts to star systems containing compatible atmospheres. But it's ridiculously random. Harrison shrugged. It would allow us to narrow our search from billions of possibilities to... Oh, maybe uh, only a few hundred thousand. She stood up, frustrated that he would toy with her this way. Furious that she had quite obviously been misled, that neither Jacoby nor Blackwood had been honest with her about the nature of the project. Dr. Blackwood, she said, struggling to keep her tone cool and professional. You and I both know that I wasn't hired to daydream. If you refuse to tell me why I've been hired, then I must assume that it was to do bio-warfare research, in which case I am going straight to Dr. Jacoby's office to resign. I made it quite clear from the start that I will not participate in research of that nature. Harrison sat forward and sighed, his expression and tone of voice all seriousness. I'm sorry, Suzanne. He gestured at her chair. Please sit. I'll level with you. She folded her arms and sat. He looked down at his hands and fidgeted uncomfortably under her steady gaze. We haven't deceived you, Suzanne. If I've put off telling you about the project, it's because I wanted you to feel at home before we discussed it. The nature of the project has nothing to do with bio-warfare, but it's not exactly a pleasant topic of conversation either. He looked up at her and hesitated. I'd like you to analyze some blood and tissue samples, a thorough analysis. 
She started to speak, but he raised his hand. Before you protest, I'm afraid I lied about your resume. I remember it very well. Just trying to get you to talk about yourself a little. I know you were a certified medical technician, that you worked as one while getting your graduate degrees. I also know you minored in anatomy as an undergrad. You're qualified, more qualified than anyone else who applied for this job, who could apply for this job. That's why I asked Ephraim to hire you. He was complimenting her to try to soften the blow. Good God, what was so horrible about this job that he couldn't even bring himself to tell her what it was? That's very flattering, she replied evenly, but I still don't understand. An analysis of what sort of blood, human, a specific individuals? He watched her carefully. I've gotten hold of a sample of alien blood and tissue samples from 1953. A thorough analysis was never done, not to mention that with the tools and techniques available to us now, our analysis can be much more exhaustive. She stared at him for a while before finding her voice. No one had ever spoken to her about the alien invasion in years, since she was a girl back in Iowa. Her parents had shielded her as best they could from any real information about it, but there was no restraining a child's imagination. It didn't matter how many times her mother told her it was all over. They were all dead. They weren't ever going to come to Iowa. Suzanne used to lie, shivering under the covers at night, expecting them to come for her the way they did for Uncle Matthew. She had never even been able to talk to Deb about it. After all, what was the point in frightening the child over something that could never happen again? Even now, adults almost never spoke about it if the subject could be avoided. It had been briefly discussed in one or two of her college classes, with that peculiar dread otherwise reserved for nuclear annihilation. Always, always with the qualification that Earth's microbial life was too deadly for the aliens, and there was no chance for their return. I, uh, I thought, she stammered, that all that had been done before, that they had been analyzed to death. From a scientific standpoint, there's not much point in rehashing that again. No, Harrison answered, still looking hard at her. Any samples Pitt had were destroyed by looters when people were evacuating the West Coast. And as soon as the invasion was over, the government confiscated any samples researchers had. We have only minimal information about the aliens. Not enough. But how did you get these samples? He smiled. Juan adds, There are some government workers out there willing to take some pretty big risks for the right amount of cash. But those samples are 35 years old. They've no doubt deteriorated so badly by now. There's probably very little information we could get from them. Whatever we can get would be useful. He rolled up his chair to the desk and leaned forward. It's a real scientific opportunity. I'm not sure. It doesn't sound like much of a project. Once I've analyzed these samples, then what? I want to know how the bacteria killed them, whether or not they could possibly learn to adapt, to develop defenses against our microbes. She almost stood up. Frankly, Dr. Blackwood, all this smacks of paranoia. He sat back in his chair. Maybe. But consider what might happen. He paused, seemed to struggle with something, then continued. I thought your attitude might be different, considering... Considering what? Your uncle, Matthew Van Buren, one of the first to die in the alien attack, along with my parents. She did stand up now. What a cruel thing to say! Harrison tilted his head, confused. It was cruel. That's why I'm here. That's why Norton's here. He lost his entire family in an alien attack. That's why I thought you'd be interested in helping out. After all, we have something in common. Matthew Van Buren's niece, your second cousin, Sylvia, was my adoptive father's fiance. A glint of humor shone in his eyes. Just think, we're practically related. The humor faded quickly. 
After the invasion, he saw to it that Sylvia was well cared for. Her cheeks burned, even though he hadn't added in a mental institution. Cousin Sylvia had gone mad after the invasion and been locked away, forgotten by the family, an embarrassment which was mentioned only rarely, and then in hushed tones. Suzanne had met her only once when she was four, and Sylvia had already suffered her first of many breakdowns. Suzanne remembered little of her cousin, except that Sylvia had been quiet and withdrawn. Harrison noticed her reaction. Maybe I was wrong. The Midwest was safe, and you were born just a few years before the invasion. Maybe you don't care because you never experienced it yourself. His expression hardened. You have an eleven-year-old daughter, Suzanne. Don't you want to learn something about these these creatures before it happens again? Quite honestly, Dr. Blackwood, I think that's a sick attitude to take, she said. The aliens can never return. Even a school kid knows that. They're dead the instant they're exposed to our microbes. Harrison emphasized each word. You don't know that. We've got to learn more about them. The more we know, the better off we are. Maybe I should have stayed in Ohio. She didn't really intend to say it, but there it was. He rose. She could tell that under his civil veneer, he was very angry. I'm sorry. I thought because, well, never mind. If you really want to go back to Ohio, I'm sure Pitt will cover your expenses. That's what Norton's really looking for, isn't it? She said as it occurred to her. Not just extraterrestrial life in general. He's looking for them. That's right, Harrison answered, with an expression that said, The hell with you if you don't like it. He's looking for them. Now are you going to work with us or not? They glared at each other for a while. She actually continued packing it all up again, but she couldn't face that right now. Not just yet. Maybe if she played along with Blackwood for a while, looked at his precious samples, she could find another project to work on at Pitts. All right, she said finally. I'll do it. Surely out of scientific curiosity, but frankly, it's a waste of time and money, and the minute I can link up with another project here, I'm gone. He sighed, relieved, and smiled, but she detected the obsession in his eyes. It frightened her. The man's not right. Well, what do you care so long as you have a job and Deb doesn't go hungry? You won't regret it, Blackwood told her. And after all, we are paying you well. She stiffened. This may be hard for you to understand, Dr. Blackwood, but money isn't the most important thing I derive from my job. I like to feel that what I'm doing is meaningful, now, if you'll excuse me. His expression became serious for the first time since she'd met him. Believe me, Suzanne, it's the most important work you've ever done. The most important work you'll ever do. But she was already walking out of his office and pretended not to hear. She always tried to be honest with herself, and she knew she hadn't been totally upfront with Blackwood. It wasn't just that she thought the project redundant. It was that she had never seen one of them, except in her childish nightmares, and she wasn't sure she could stand to look at one in the flesh, even now. <laughs>